my research began in Glasgow when I was training in palliative care and in homeopathy and I started looking at the patients I was seeing in my cancer clinic and started to uh, collect very good data and outcome measures and then I started to focus in on women with breast cancer and hot flushes and fatigue um, and mood disturbance and began to see this as a symptom complex and a, a difficult clinical scenario that we were really good at treating. Then I went on to a randomised control trial of women with breast cancer on tamoxifen who had side effects of their treatment. Um, I was then able to make that work part of my thesis. Um, I was awarded a thesis from Oxford University, which is where I trained as an undergraduate, and that is, um, well, you know, that's the first homeopathic thesis to sit in the Bodleian Library, which is wonderful. Um, and that was very interesting because I started to look at research design, placebo effects. That was part of uh, the focus of my thesis. Because I was interested in trial design, I then went on to do a randomised trial of asthma in children uh, using uh, uh, usual care, usual care plus homeopathy. I think that was the first ever negative. <laughs> Actually, it's not. A, it's called a pragmatic trial, but it was a negative trial. And I remember Edzard Ernst, who's been a great critic of homeopathy, standing up and saying, you'll never get a negative pragmatic trial. And we got one. So in a way, we've done the community a service so that if they get a proper, uh, a positive pragmatic trial, they can actually say, well, you know, it's not that easy. There, there's a definite effect. More recently, I was involved in another trial design of what was called a matched cohort control group, where we took um, a group of homeopathic users and then matched that group of users in community looking at the same GP practice, the same condition, uh, age within five years and uh, something called resource use which is how much NHS resource use. Uh, so that's part of why I'm here, I'm talking about that study. You've also done some work on cost-benefit and cost-effectiveness yeah. as well, huh? Yeah, so that was this um, cohort study where we were looking at can we reduce NHS resource use uh, when we deliver a, a package of homeopathic care. Okay. And that was just a feasibility study. So um, we, the numbers aren't good enough to be able to say for sure. Uh, and in fact, the two groups, resource use was equal. But what was interesting is the homeopathic group improved in their quality of life and in their well-being, which is what we, we pick up in practice is that people are feeling better opening up their health and feeling like their lives start to shift and become more positive. And what we noticed was that it was mental health uh, improvements, mental health gain within the well-being score that improved the most. I am still challenged by the fact that we have no good trials of homeopathy in the menopause, in irritable bowel, the things that we know we're good at. Um, I'd like to get, you know, I'd like to just see lots of trials. I'd also like to see trials where you compare and contrast different complementary therapies and you look at additive things. So if you add, for example, if you run a, a mindfulness course for anxiety and depression and you then add in homeopathy, can you see any additional benefits? My hypothesis will be that you can. In other words, there'll, there'll be responders to the mindfulness, but there'll also be people who continue to be stuck. And if they're stuck, can a catalyst like um, homeopathy come in and play a part? Uh, so I'm interested in, in, in larger studies that look at multimodalities. I'm also interested in taking the work forward we've been doing on um, economic evaluation, um, but at the moment I'm, I'm more interested in a service evaluation that I think we can get data out more quickly than if we embark on a, a very high quality piece of research that could take five years to publish. There is um, a tradition for an NHS consultant to have education and research and audit as part of their working life. Um, and because of that, when you're in training, you also do the same. So when you're training clinically, you'd also be needing to demonstrate that you can research, that you can audit, that you can teach, all of those things. Um, that just suited me down to the ground because I've always been curious. I've always been, that's what 
you know, makes me a good homeopath. You have to be curious. And in the same way uh, with research, you, you need to be curious. Is this a real effect? Uh, is it an effect I'm just seeing because uh, I, I'm, you know, feeling good about myself? You know, all of those things um, in influence it. Uh, but at a practical level, I did have time and resources that I could put into research. I also had an eye to the future, so I knew that I, if we were going to develop a department, which we still don't have, a department, a university department of homeopathic medicine, um, that I would need a thesis in, or, uh, in order to be able to mentor um, and uh, bring other people through uh, the pathways. So although that hasn't borne fruit as yet, uh, I, I still hope in the future that we will have a department of homeopathic medicine. Someone like Stefan Baumgartner, who's clearly highly intelligent, very experienced, uh, basic scientist, uh, really, really wanting to follow these questions through, spending decades doing that, and then looking and watching the work begin to amass and then to, you know, take shape. Uh, and also what I liked about him was his real honesty about saying, look, you know, we're, we're far from... We have not clinched it. We, you know, we're just moving towards a time where we might get a model that's sustainable and might explain things. Um, but that's exciting.